Welcome. Welcome to this uh, GMI Competency in the EX World webinar. We shall start it in a second, give it a little bit of time for you guys to join. And uh, Bob, you will share the presentation, right? You bet. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, we run this webinar three times and during the uh, previous webinars, we had uh, several questions posed to us in the registration. Only a couple during this uh, last session, but in any case, we have put them into a secondary presentation, which we run. Uh, we will run at the end of the main presentation. So here is the main presentation coming. Let me do this. Request some more control. Okay, so guys, before we start, let me take, let me see if I can run the presentation. It's always a little leafy when we do like this, when we have two people running the same presentation. Okay. It says I got control, Bob, but I cannot control anything. Well, oh, there you go. So before we start, uh, let me introduce you, uh, Bob, Bob Johnson, our speaker today. Here it is the slide. You also have Bob's and myself contacts there. Eventually you can write to us at any time. So Bob is our speaker today and uh, he has over 30 years of experience in EX world and he's a comp EX instructor. He's also an instructor for the ICEX COPC. COPC. PC scheme. So it means he's very qualified to run this webinar because he knows very well both of the schemes available for competency in the EX world. And he's also an inspector of the US UL STP committee. So he runs many inspection and he, we have a webinar with him on mistakes that he, found, he finds on uh, installation, which are many, many, many. So competency is a very important issue we want to talk about today. Uh, before we get into that, I need to take a few moments to talk about GMI, uh, our company. We are what we do and why we do it. It's the sponsor for our webinar, so we need to do it. Okay, who is GMI? GMI is a safety company, manufacturing, engineering, designing, a complete range of intrinsically safe and safe certified devices, from IS Perry, for example which are used in automation packages, such as DCS or Parangas or SCADA or PLC packages around the industry, primarily in oil and gas, petrochemical, pharmaceutical, but also in food and bed, fertilizer, mining, basically any industry that requires EX and seal environment. We have over 40 years of experience and we are very proud of our heritage and manufacturing facility, which are located near Milan, Italy. So we have 100% production in our headquarters near Milan. But we are a global player present around the globe, all the five continents. This is a little bit about uh, our products. Our, you know, we make safety products, so we take special care. Oops, we went right. once. Yeah, you were right. I was. Are you moving or I'm moving the slides? It was it was me. Sorry. So let me go back to this slide. If I can manage. Sorry, guys. Well, Bob seems to say I don't have a control code to the next slide. <laughs> <laughs> I remove I, I better do like this. I give up remote control. I'll let you drive it. So basically, we manufacture safety products. So safety products uh, are important. So we take special care in in the manufacturing of the same. So we do 100% testing in our state-of-the-art technology. We have full product traceability. Uh, we have a very highly automated process to avoid any human errors. As a matter of fact, we have functional safety certification SC3. So up to C3, we can manufacture products. And of course, we have social responsibility. We meaning that we try to make our customer happy and uh, why contributing to a sustainable world. So better, you know, less accident mean uh, 
minimizing climate impact and creating a safer and healthier work environment for all of us. These are the product we manufacture. So IS barriers, safety relays, isolators, which are sealed certified. Power supply, also sealed and EX certified. We have multiplexer, temperature multiplexer, hard multiplexers. We have a series of termination board, which we, they are used to interface uh, many system out there. We have SPD or surge protection device. We have loop indicators and we have a division that runs services in the functional safety domain and soon in the EX domain in collaboration with Bob. So we will, if this COVID situation gets better, it seems like it is sometime and sometimes it's getting worse. It's a, it's a roller coaster. And, uh, but I'm hoping the next year will be better. We'll be able to run some courses. Last year we ran 18 courses. Uh, we have eight, nine subsidiaries around the globe. We have many distributors and we have thousands of installations with our customers, some of which are, next slide, Bob. Okay, here we go. System vendors from maybe to Yokogawa. We operate project with many, many EPC, uh, Petrofar, Kamek, Poster Wheeler, Technimont, Worley, and so on. And we have many, many customers that are OEMs, so they install our product into their equipment, such as uh, gas compressor or skis, or, uh, pumps, well head packages, and so on. And we are in the AVL of many oil and gas companies around the globe. So I believe I run, let's see next. Next, it's you, Bob. So before I let you talk, uh, let me remind our guests, uh, let me see if they're on here. Okay, there, there is a question and answer box there. You can throw out the webinar, post question. This is the only way you can talk to us today. Um, so you can pose a question, we'll try to answer it as we go along or maybe at the end of the presentation. Uh, feel free to do so. We are, you know, Bob, you would see, is, knows a lot. The speak is great. Of course, try to remain on the subject that we're talking about today. Okay, Bob. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Paul. Go for a few miles to get a cup of coffee, but guys, I'm here. No, no worries, no worries. Well, thank you very much uh, for the introduction, and, and thank you all for joining us. And uh, uh, competency in the EX world, we have to, we have a spell issue there, so <laughs> we missed an R. But anyway, that's okay. Yeah, you're right. But we weren't very competent when we were putting this slide <laughs> together. <laughs> we were Italian, so you know. Uh, that's okay. Secondary. Well, you'll have to excuse me because it is just after midnight here in Houston, Texas. So it's uh, if I if I seem a little bit groggy, uh, please forgive me. But I'll I'll do my best to to try to get through this and and hopefully answer a lot of questions that you might have. So competency, it's it's a big topic. It's a very important topic with regards to EX, and it gets talked about. You see it in a lot of specifications. So the important thing is to remember, well, what is competency, right? So the definition of competency comprises basically three things, a combination of your knowledge, the skills, as well as your behavior. So when we think about our explosion triangle, right? We talk about a fuel, a source of ignition, and air. Well, that we have to have a triangle in which to have an explosion, so to speak. The same thing holds true for competency. So it's not just knowledge, it's not just your skills, and it's not just behavior, it's a combination of all three. So here's the key thing to remember, again, with experience. A ton of experience is great, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the individual is competent. And a good example is when we teach some of the competency programs, part of some of the programs that we do we actually have people correctly install cable glands. And we sometimes will have uh, electrical sparkies come in and they've been installing glands for years and years and years. And they look at this, they say, oh, this is easy, no problem, whatever. And then they go ahead and start doing it and then they do it wrong. And they say, well, this is the way we've always been doing it. And I said, well, you've been doing it wrong for the last 20 years. So let me show you how to do it right. And this is the way you're supposed to do it right. So again, experience alone is not the only thing. So a good example is an airline pilot. You know, typically the airlines will get their pilots from the military. 
they don't just automatically go from flying F-16s or F-18s to all of a sudden flying an Airbus or something like that. They have to go through training and they have to be deemed competent. They go through the simulators and they have a, a supervisor pilot that, that determines whether or not this individual is competent to fly that plane. So it's the whole concept of, of determining and the assessment that determines whether or not somebody is competent. So you have to demonstrate that capability. So where did competency really come in with regards to the EX world? And basically we can kind of go back to 1988 with the Piper Alpha explosion in the North Sea. So there was 167 people lost. Um, it, was, it was at the time, well still, uh, it was the largest um, disaster, if you will, in the offshore market with regards to loss of life. It accounted for about 3.4 billion pounds uh, loss, and it constituted about 10% of the total North Sea production. Now, up until that point, uh, when oil was found in the North Sea, it was pretty much kind of like the wild, wild west, what we say here in the United States. Everybody was just going to try to discover things, right? Same thing was holding true in the North Sea. Uh, the owner operators were trying to get out to the fields not saying that they necessarily were cutting corners, but they were very, very aggressive as far as development and trying to get first oil. And they did, and it was very heady. Piper Alpha basically put pretty much everybody uh, at a screeching halt to kind of say, hey, wait a minute, do we need to do a better job? So what happened is that there was what was called the Cullen Report that came out about two years to the day after the explosion. And in the Cullen Report, there was 106 recommendations and every single one of those recommendations were implemented. And one of the primary things that was discussed was that the employer should be responsible for its competency of its employees. So now all of a sudden we started seeing competency being shown up. So all of the offshore operators carried out immediate wide ranging assessments of their installations. And the two key areas were improvements of the permit to work and initiation of formal safety assessments. Now Piper Alpha, what the issue was there is that there was actually a, a mistake with a permit to work system. It was a situation in which a temporary flange was put on a compressor that was supposed to be out of service. And then unfortunately it was switched on, it was energized, pressurized, and the temporary flange released, expanding all that uh, gas, if you will, to the platform it hit a source of ignition and that was what caused the explosion. So, but it was basically this initiation of formal safety assessments that was really the key thing. So all of the electrical operators that were remaining in the North Sea, now mind you, Piper Alpha was an Occidental Petroleum company or uh, platform and uh, Oxy actually moved out of the North Sea after that. But all the remaining operators, the folks like Shell and BP and, and SO, Chevron, all of the other owner operators basically got together, the technical advisors. And they all got together and they said, hey, we have to do a better job with regards to the electrical people because this could have been an electrical issue. And so they came up with the idea of a training program and that was the foundation of what is now known as CompX. And Compex started up in 1994 in Aberdeen College. And it was driven not by a governmental mandate, it was really driven by the owner operators in the North Sea. And the way they enforced it was, if you were gonna do any electrical work on those rigs, you would have to go through and get your Compex certificate. So Compex kind of went along for quite some time and then within Europe, there was the ATEX 153 directive, and that came into play in the early 2000s. Now that directive deals specifically with the health and safety of the workers and the responsibility of the employers for the workers in a facility that could potentially have a flammable gas air or dust hazard uh, situation. Now it put the onus on the owner operators to make sure that if they were gonna send somebody out into their facility and they were responsible for some sort of accident, they potentially could be held liable. So all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, the demand for competency programs became very important. 
So it was really driven by some UK owner operators, but, but of course, then it gets picked up by standards. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the standards, why, where it is and, and what standards are out there so you can understand and, and what, where this is all coming from, if you will. So as you're probably all aware, the 60079 standards and the 80079 standards are the IEC standards or EN standards that uh, reference electrical installations or hazardous areas. The DASH 14 standard is the standard that deals specifically with uh, electrical installation, design, selection, and erection. So the DASH 14 standard is a very, very important standard to, to make sure you understand. As a matter of fact, the competency programs are very much based upon the, the data that's in the DASH 14 standard. And of course, the UK version, the BSEN, or the Senelec version, the EN version is, is virtually identical. There's also a DASH 17 standard, which deals with maintenance and inspection of EX equipment. There's also the DASH 34 standard that deals specifically with manufacturers of EX equipment. And there was a change that just recently took place that competency is now showing up in those standards or that standard as well. There are some other standards as well within the IEC world in which competency does show up. So just because it is a standard, if you will, does not necessarily mean that it has regulatory weight, if you will, right? A standard is just a standard. It's written, it's a technical paper. It's really up to a particular regulatory agency or some sort of governmental agency to adopt it and say, you must do this. And so there are regulatory agencies throughout the world that have adopted these IEC standards as their electrical standards or have adopted some of this competency and made this mandatory. Some of the examples here that you see the health and safety executive is in the UK. Here in the United States, we have a couple different regulatory agencies. Uh, the United States Coast Guard is one of them and they've now actually just recently started to mandate it. NOPSEMA in Australia. And there are other governmental agencies and organizations around the world that are starting to demand competency. The important thing to note though, is that even though this may be not regulated by a governmental agency, a lot of large integrated oil and gas companies that operate worldwide will actually have these competency requirements in their standards. So it's important for you to understand that if you're doing skid packages for some of these companies, they very well may demand this competency requirement. So be aware of it. Uh, one thing that just happened here in the United States, and I realize there's probably nobody from the US that's on right now because this is at midnight and nobody would wanna be on with me at this particular point in time. But the US Coast Guard has actually just come out with this marine safety alert. And they have basically, this is the first time that in the United States that we've actually now have a, a governmental agency starting to reference competency and starting to demand this. And this is gonna apply to LNG fueled vessels. Um, so the Coast Guard has a jurisdiction over LNG fueled vessels. And so now you're starting to see this. We expect that we'll see this also apply to a lot of the offshore, mobile offshore drilling units in the Gulf of Mexico. And, and you will see this in other parts of the world as well, I am sure. So guys. So, Paula, we have our first poll question. We have a poll question, so I'm gonna launch a poll. So poll basically, question. Bob has been telling us that there are several standards that talk about competency. So we wanna make sure you've been listening to us, you know. Uh, so it's a simple question to you guys. What standard includes define specific level of competency. You can just click on there, nobody will judge you. Let us know how do you... <laughs> we won't laugh, I promise. Let me give it a little hint here today. I believe it's a multiple choice answer, this one, right? I would say you're absolutely correct. There's right. more than one correct answer. There's more than one correct answer. That is correct. Maybe we should have had one choice there, which we did not. But uh, uh, some of you have answered um, already. And uh, let's give it a few more moments. There is a standard which is primarily, you know, 
I, I would say it would look like the best answer. But uh, and you guys are answering that. But uh, I'm, I'm fortunate. But it is uh, multiple choice means yes, uh, you can click more than once before you answer, right? Yes. So. Yeah. Yes. It's difficult to judge how many of you have answered because if you have uh, multiple choice, we have no idea how many have clicked. Um, that is true. That Zoom is has some uh, limitation. So, okay, let me hand the poll here and show your answers. Share result. Okay, Bob, and we comment that. Okay, yes. So, so you guys are paying attention. The Dash 14 is the design standard. And that's the one where a lot of the competency requirements have really uh, originated out of, originated out of. The 61508, for any of you who are involved in functional safety, uh, and the 65, 61511 standards on functional safety also actually define competency. So those could also be correct answers. The 10-1 is actually an area classification standard for gas uh, atmospheres. Um, it doesn't directly reference competency, although it does indirectly. So actually all five of those are truly correct answers. There's not a wrong one. So yeah, that's what I was mentioned. Maybe we should put another uh, choice and another all of the above because basically oh. competency is uh, percolating everywhere nowadays, you know. That's it's true. Like um, it's what something you expect. Everybody expects competency in when we go to a yeah. doctor or if you go to to our carpenter, you know, somebody to do a home, we expect him to be competent, right? We would expect, right. right. Oh, we, look for, we look for some more so in an environment where we you know the risk are very high, we, we you know competence mandatory and important. Okay, Bob, let me continue. Okay, so now we fast forward to 2010 and we're all familiar with what happened with Deepwater Horizon. In this case, 11 people died. Um, there was obviously the, the media here focused an awful lot on the oil uh, spill in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and of course, the well went, went unchecked for about 90 or so days before they finally were able to, to shut it down. But uh, the economic impact on this was actually, actually it's more than $45 billion. I think it was more like 50 to $55 billion. Um, so obviously it was a huge, huge environmental issue. It was a huge setback for the oil and gas industry and the offshore industry in particular, but it, it had also a big impact on regards to standards and rules and regulations. So there was a report, just like the Cullen report that had come out on the Piper Alpha, there was the U.S. Coast Guard Bessie joint report that came out of Deepwater Horizon. And one of the things that was really important that a lot of people kind of missed, didn't really see it, but if you see there highlighted in blue, it was talking about some of the electrical equipment was in bad condition, severely corroded, and that a subcontractor's equipment that was in poor condition had been left in hazardous areas. Because of these deficiencies, there's no assurance that the electrical equipment was safe and could not have caused the explosions. Now, if you saw the movie, um, the, the source of ignition in the movie, and it was a really good movie, if you haven't seen it, it's worth watching, is there was obviously the blowout of the BOP, the release of gas and vapors into the atmosphere, and there was a drawing in of those gases and vapors into the engines. Now, normally those engines would have something called a rig safe. As soon as the sensors would pick up that there was a flammable atmosphere, it would shut them down. But the rig safes were actually shut down at that particular point in time due to maintenance issues. But that was determined in the movie as the source of ignition. But in reality, the Coast Guard believed that there was actually an ex initial explosion on the drill floor. And there's not a lot of equipment on the drill floor other than potentially EX equipment. So a lot of people felt that it was actually some EX equipment was potentially that source of ignition. Now, a lot of people think that if I buy certified products, you know, then I'm, I'm okay. Everything is fine, right? Um, these pictures here that you see, the top two left ones, if you will, those are actual pieces of EX equipment that are actually installed into zone one areas. And those pieces of equipment were operational at the time when those pictures were taken. 
Now, you would, you, would, uh, you would be shocked to know that those pieces of equipment were actually only about three years old. So the corrosive environment in an offshore oil platform can be extremely <laughs> bad. But is, that was a motor on the left-hand side, <clears throat> excuse me, that was operational in a zone one area. So it didn't matter if it was a certified product or not. At the point in time, due to lack of maintenance, due to basically somebody taking a look at that and saying, hey, wait a minute, this could be a problem, uh, that potentially could be a source of ignition. So the important thing is the proper selection, the proper installation, and the proper knowledge and maintenance is all key. Okay, it's not just the certification. So a lot of people, and, and I know we probably have some designers here that probably think, hey, it's just the operational folks that are doing stupid things out there. And Lord knows they do. But when we actually look at some of the root causes of some of the major industrial accidents, we actually find uh, operations and, and, or I should say installation and commissioning is actually a fairly small percentage of some of the major root causes when we go back and start investigating a lot of these large industrial accidents. Well, we actually find the biggest percentage of the pie, if you will, is your specifications. Now, <coughs> excuse me, the specifications could be a situation where maybe uh, you're specifying a product or maybe you're working with a company in which they're specifying one particular their specification doesn't really make sense, so you have to interpret and try to provide something else, or there's maybe a mix-up or something else. And Lord knows, at the end of the day, what actually gets out there isn't truly appropriate. So you can see, however, that all of these pieces of the pie can be potentially big issues. The design, the operation maintenance, changes after commissioning, you know, maybe we go back into an EX box and we start drilling entries into an EXD enclosure, which is not allowed. So all of these things are potential root causes. So what you see on the right-hand side there is some panels. Uh, this was one where my colleague here actually did an inspection for, for an offshore oil platform not too terribly long ago. And in a zone two area, these, these gas detection panels were installed. And if you notice on there, it says non-hazardous NEMA 4X. These were non-EX panels located in a zone two area. Now, is that an operation issue? Okay, maybe the operator should have known better or an installer should have known better to not install a non-hazardous panel into a hazardous location. But it could have been a specification, it could have been a design, it could have been any number of factors. So when we actually look at the failure rate, when we do inspections of EX equipment, anywhere from 20 to 45% could be a fault. Now, some of these faults can be major and some of these could be minor, but what are the issues? It's the lack of training, knowledge, lack of competency. I know, Bob, that we <coughs> have, Excuse me. went to, uh, we have Excuse a call me. for you guys. It's an easy <laughs> one. We just talked about this. I launched the poll while you answer that. You know, I know we have run this webinar three times today. This is the third time, but still amazes me, you know, looking at a feature like that of a box, which is not designed for us as this location, and you find the titan as this location. You know, it's like putting a ticking bomb in there. It's, it's how can a person, you know, not know that? And right. Well, in, in and all the competencies had to do also with the, complacency or maybe, you know? Well, you know, I, I started my career working for a manufacturer, right? And I started off in design engineering for a manufacturer. And, and I used to, and I worked at the factory and we built these great and wonderful products. And then when I eventually went out into field sales and started talking with customers directly and seeing the products that we manufactured, in the hands, I started realizing, holy cow, a lot of people are not applying and using our products correctly. And so I used to think, okay, well, it's not so much an engineering issue, but the more that I've done this and the more I've seen more and more pieces of equipment out there, uh, you start realizing that there's a lot of faults that are done at the very early stages. And so if we look at our poll results, right, yeah. you can see that specifications is the key thing. 
Again, all of these are issues, but specifications is generally the one thing that we can we can identify as that major root cause. And as a manufacturer, we know that quite well because typically, you know, we do not get the proper specification to select product and safety product. You know, it's important to select the correct product. So, right. you know, uh, if you don't have that, how can you, if you don't know what you want, how can we provide you the right product? <laughs> that is true. And often, and it has led to a situation where you have an installed you have an oil rig, it has to go out or a platform, and all of a sudden, somebody who has competency, you know, reviews the work, and says, guys, all of these instruments are wrong, and you need to rush to replace them, you know, with the correct devices. It's, yeah. it's got, you have some, you know, assessment is also important. Right, right. There is assessment. So okay. what does the standard actually say? Um, and it's, it's actually only about two and a half pages in the Dash 14 standard. So there's three roles. There's the responsible persons. So this could be a project engineer, project manager. The operator technicians could be those folks that are responsible for the selection and uh, erection. So these are typically the, uh, the hired, the hands, the contractors that are actually installing the equipment. And then the designers. And those folks are the ones that are responsible for the design and selection of the systems and equipment. So we, we specifically say that if you have one of these roles, there are some specific details of what you should be able to show as being competent. So we again divide up and I won't go through all this, but if you, if you look at this or we can send this to you or you can look in the dash 14 and annex A, you'll see this and it specifically tells you now here's the thing, the assessment shall be verified and attributed at intervals relevant to national regulations or standards or user requirements on the basis of sufficient evidence that the person A has the skill, can act competently, and they have the relevant knowledge and understanding. So there's our behavior with the knowledge and we're able to assess them uh, in some way, shape or form. Excuse me. Now, some of you may be involved in intrinsic safety since this is a GMI seminar and GMI is known for uh, intrinsically safe products. The Dash 25 standard, which we didn't really talk about, but that's the standard for creating an intrinsically safe system. And part of that is that when we build a descriptive system document, a DSD, we actually state within the standard that the person who does that should be competent. Now that DSD is basically your loop diagram, which we cover in actually a different webinar, but that loop diagram is supposed to be done by an individual that is deemed to be competent, right? So there's competency again. As a manufacturer of EX equipment, this standard is basically a bolt-on to your ISO 9001 requirements for your quality process. And this was addition two that was updated in 2018. And this competency section was added into the standard. And the reason it was added into it is that a lot of manufacturers were producing products that in effect were either not properly marked or there were issues or what have you. So guess what? Competency is now a requirement for those manufacturers that are building EX equipment. So we're seeing competence showing up in a lot of different standards. In matter of fact, there is actually going to be now an IEC technical specification, the 60079-44, that's gonna come out in May of 2021. So it'll take a lot of that relevant competency information that's noted in the 14, the 17, 19, and the other standards as a recommendation to follow. So it's taking all of this competency stuff and putting it in one technical specification that people can use and it'll expand the roles uh, of what you saw previously for responsible person, designers, operators. There's gonna be additional roles that will be put into that. So Bob, how do we become competent? Oh, oh go ahead. Now I was saying, how do we become competent? Then? Yeah, so how do you become competency, right? Or how do you become competent? So there are two main formalized training programs, competency programs in the marketplace today. And we'll talk a little bit about both of them. 
I mentioned Compex where that started off and that started off in the UK based upon what took place under the Piper Alpha explosion. So that's been around now since uh, I think it was 1994, so about 26 years now. And it's probably the most well-known. Um, the IEC EX now also has a competency program that was developed about 10, 12 or so years ago. And that's much more well-known. Uh, certainly IEC EX, as far as equipment cert, is definitely much uh, known in various parts of the world but many people are not familiar with the Certificate of Personnel Competency, which is part of the IECEX. So there's, there's two major programs. There are other programs in the world, but I'll focus my attention because I know both of these very well. So the COMPEX has 14 units, 14 training programs and assessment programs. Uh, I won't go through all of these, but basically they're, they're broken down for operatives, designers, and responsible persons. They cover electrical and mechanical hazards. So again, we're talking about the requirements in 14, 17, and the 80079 standards, as well as some of the other 60079 standards. So the most common one is the EX01 through 4 program. That was the original. Um, that's the one that most centers offer. Uh, that's a four and a half to five day program. What you see on the right-hand side is actually our bays at our facility here in Houston. Uh, so those are examples of some of the practical installation bays. So there's hands-on inspection and installation. There's also what is called an EX-12 course, which is a design course, and that is a five-day program with four exams. Now, mind you, these are both training and assessment programs. So you go through training and then you're assessed. So there's 52 centers. Most of them are located in the UK. There's an organization called JT Limited that owns the Compex scheme. The training and assessment centers are run by third party organizations, uh, but each one of those are vetted, vetted and audited by JTL. And JTL determines the course content to be delivered by that third party. Now, the one benefit of Compex is that there is a very much a consistency throughout the world with regards to the training and assessment because JTL runs it. That's the way it is. So if you go to one center versus another one, it's, it's a very similar program. Under the IECEX Certificate of Personnel Competency, in this case, there's actually 11 modules. Uh, the ones that I highlighted in blue here is basically the ones that would be, um, we're actually going to be offering in conjunction with GMI uh, at some point in time to be able to actually provide this in on a local basis around the world. The 001 is your fundamentals program and the 009 is the design program, but the design module. But people can take multiple modules uh, depending on their roles and what they wish to, to achieve. And it's all based upon the 60079 and the 80079 standards. So it's a very similar concept, uh, but it is different. Now, how does this work? So there's what is called IECEX certifying bodies. And IECEX certifying bodies are those certifying bodies that certify products. But some of them have also gotten into what is called the COPC scheme, the Certificate of Personnel Competency Scheme. And 15 of them right now around the world are actually in this program. They've gone through the assessment. They've said, we wish to be the assessors for the COPC scheme. So it's very similar to a product certification, but the candidates are assessed against the operational document OD 504. So if you want to find out more about each one of those modules, you can go to the IECEX website under IECEX.com, look for operational document OD504, and that tells you exactly what each module is trying to assess against. Now there's also what is called an IECEX recognized training provider. Uh, there are 32 recognized training providers. We're located worldwide. We are located in Houston and we are vetted, if you will, and approved by the IECEX to deliver the course content. Here's the important thing, however. 
the candidates are not mandated to be trained by a training provider. Remember the certificate of personnel competency scheme is actually an assessment scheme. So you can walk in off the street if you have the proper credentials, the work experience and all this other good stuff and you wanna be assessed, either take exams or do practical assessments, you can do that without going through some sort of formalized training program. However, the benefit of doing it with an RTP, and most of the RTPs have aligned themselves with an IECEXCB. So the RTB does the training, the EXCB does the assessment. So for example, we actually work with an organization called QPS out of Canada, that's an IECEX certifying body where we do the training, the uh, QPS will actually grade the exams and issue the certs. So a little bit here, that's a little bit different. The training modules can be fixed or portable. Most of your compact centers are truly fixed. Uh, there are some portable units, but they're much bigger, if you will, <clears throat> excuse me, than the, than the, uh, the EX, uh, IEC EX training modules. So for example, on the picture, what you see there, that's an example of an EX003, which is an installation of EX power and intrinsic safety located on two panels that can be set up in an office, can be set up in a warehouse, set up anywhere, and basically go through the assessment process. The written exams are pulled from a common database. Um, unlike Compex, each one of the EXCBs comes up with their own practical exercises approved by an IEC EX auditor. So unlike Compex, where every center is very, very similar, the IEC EX can be a little bit different. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just be aware of that. They can all be, they have variations on the theme. So your certificates under Compex or under the IEC EX, they are both suitable or will last for five years. Um, at the end of five years, it's, uh, you have to go and redo it and get your certification redone. So, and the reason why five years is generally speaking, the EX or the 60079 standards usually change enough in five years in which there's enough changes that it's important to keep your certification going. So, Compex and IEC EX are both five years. One big benefit of the IEC EX is that you can actually see on the IEC EX website, you can actually see a person's credentials. It's published right there just like a product cert. The, unfortunately, the compact certs are not that way. So that is a, that's a very nice thing about the IECEX. So here's the important thing to remember. <clears throat> there are training programs, there are assessment programs out there. Competency is very important, right? You're seeing this, we know this, every time that we hear about some industrial disaster that takes place, in many cases, it's because somebody did something that was stupid or wrong or what have you, right? Um, generally speaking, it, equipment doesn't just fail or something like that. It's usually there's some sort of human factor. So we don't want you to be that human factor that fails, that causes the next Piper Alpha or Deepwater Horizon. We wanna make sure that whatever facility that we're working in if we're a responsible designer or if we're a technician or we're an operator or a maintenance person, we want to make sure that we take ownership of safety. It's really important. And again, it's only as strong as its weakest link. We don't want you to be that weakest link. Oh, great, Bob. So next. Oh. So, okay, great, Bob. As usual, you know, you're very competent in your... <laughs> I'm competent in using Zoom. <laughs> yeah, you learned that. That is uh, for sure. So while we do that, so guys, we have another 15 minutes. We're going to, we, as we said earlier, we received some questions and answered through the registration process of the last uh, webinars and this webinar. So we'll answer some questions. We have no live question today. So guys, you know, if you have any questions, do post them. So stop sharing this presentation. I'll share the question and answer presentation. Well, Okay. I'm competent in doing that. So what do I do? I go back here and we share screen. I'm always a little, okay, here we go. 
Does it look good? Looks brilliant. It looks brilliant, good, because I don't see it, you know. This is the problem when you have a single screen. <laughs> you only see. So these, these the were audience. some of the questions that we've had from some of the previous uh, uh, webinars that we've done and uh, questions that were asked from various people. So hopefully this will facilitate some, uh, some thoughts on your end. So. So this is the first question we got. It was, uh, I'm a designer interested in ICEX Comp PC. What module would you recommend? If I remember correctly, there are several modules. So for a designer, here was the answer we prepared. Right. Uh, right. Yeah, I think I mentioned this a little bit in the in the presentation. So under the IECEX COPC, the modules I would recommend would be well. First off. Um, as I mentioned, there's 11 different modules under the IECEX, right? And the 001 is the fundamentals course, if you will. That's the one you, everybody who wants to take any of the other modules, you have to take that one. That's the only prerequisite. Um, so once you take 001, then you can pick or choose whatever modules you wanna take. So the way that we actually do the training is, is about a day and a half in the 001 and it's about three and a half hour exam, written exam. And then we follow that up with the 00, EX009, which is a designer course. So the difference is, is that under the fundamentals course, we talk about the fundamentals of area classification. We talk about the fundamentals of all of the EX protection concepts. We talk about what are some of the requirements, gland selections, cable selections, all of that stuff that you're gonna find out of Dash 14. When we go into the 009, then we start going into deeper knowledge, a lot more into intrinsic safety and some of the design details, some of the assembly requirements, some of the mechanical requirements. So the 001 and the 009 would be the two modules that I would recommend for a designer that if they wanna get their competency um, to go through. Now that's, we, we do it in a four day. Some organizations might do it in three days. Some people may do it in five days, but generally speaking, anywhere from about three to five days uh, to go through something like that. Yeah, sorry for not sharing the correct uh, slide uh, in time. I still had a little problem with it. I still not competent with Zoom. So next, uh, which is better? Well, wow, this is a, a tough question for you, Bob. You know, you run both courses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're both giving you, you know, I imagine there's pros and cons in both, but you cannot talk there about anyone. There but is. Maybe there are some differences. That yeah, I, I, I want to align for. Yeah, the Compex is, is better on some instances. Yeah, uh, Compex is, is uh, more consistent. So every center is going to be very, very similar. So I'm an assessor under Compex. I could pretty much walk into any Compex center around the world and I could assess immediately based upon, because I know the layouts of the bays, I know exactly how it's run. So it, there's no, there's, it's very, very consistent, which is very nice. Um, however, on the other hand, it, it's not as flexible as the IECEX. So the IECEX is a lot more flexibility with regards to the course content, um, the relevancy of a lot of stuff. So. They're both good. They're both fantastic programs. One question that we did have one time from one student where he had had Compex and he was thinking about going and getting his IECEX COPC. And I told him personally, there's no reason to do that unless you just want to increase your knowledge and, and you know, because a lot of the base material is gonna be very similar. Um, I certainly don't want to discourage somebody, but either one is fine. And here's the other important thing that I didn't really mention. If you notice the, the, in the standard, it does not say COMPEX. It does not say IECEX. It just says that the person shall be assessed to be competent. So that can be done in many different ways. In some cases, people can say, well, look, we can do in-house training that's fine. It's whether or not that's recognized and it's done in a fashion that meets the requirements of the standard. 
the reason why Compex became so well known was a lot of oil and gas companies said, no, we insist upon this. And the reason why you're seeing a lot more IECEX is because people are familiar with the product scheme and they're now adding this into what their requirements are into their specifications as well. So. Okay, well, that sounds good. So let's go to the next question, which is uh, about 8007934 standard. Uh, if you are need to build product according to the standard, what competency do you recommend? What are the options for competency in those standards? Right. So this was, uh, as I mentioned, the latest edition that came out in 2018 that really uh, said specifically that now people within organizations that build the X equipment shall be deemed competent. So there isn't, at this particular point, there isn't a specific program within the IECEX or COMPEX uh, specifically around that. Now, what I would recommend to somebody if they were a manufacturer is go through the, the COPC EX001, which is the fundamentals course, and that's probably sufficient or there is a complex what is called EXF, which is a foundation course, which is a two day course. Either one of those would be, you know, in my opinion, fantastic. If I was doing design of products, then maybe I'd wanna take the 009 as well, or, or take the complex 12 module, which is the five day course, so. Okay, that's it. Uh, well, this question is about how do we, our guest, find out more about IECX and COMPC. Right, yeah, so on the IECX website, uh, there's a lot of free documents under the IECX website. There's not free standards, but there are free documents. Yeah. So as I mentioned, the OD504 is a great document you can download, it's free. Um, and it's just been recently updated. I think version three has just come out. So that's a, that's a good one. The OD502 is your application for an IECEX COPC. The 521, that's the, that's the one that we had to go through to become a recognized training provider program. Uh, but really the 504 and the 502 would really be documents that you'd want to go and look at. So you'll see them on the left-hand side called operational documents. You can download them. Again, you can reach out to any of those EXCBs that are listed as IECEX certifying bodies for the Certificate of Personnel Competency. You can also reach out to recognized training providers uh, to get more information as well. How about uh, CompX? Yeah, yeah. So the way you find out on CompX is go to the website of compX.org.uk and here you, you, there's, there's some good amount of information, <clears throat> but if you're interested, what you would really wanna do is go into the contact or look at the various centers and find a center that works best for you, wherever you're, um, and go see, uh, and it, it'll have a list of all the centers that can provide the various modules and reach out to those centers and they can tell you what they can offer. We had talked about this earlier. We said that uh, in IEC 611 and 508, so the C standard competence is also a requirement. So where is it reference? What uh, should, uh, you know, remember we are also offering financial safety training and competence, competency courses. So right. that is the first standard, correct? Yes, it's in both 61508 and the 61511, and there's there's various 61508 and 61511-1-2, so forth and so on. One of the key things, however, that I think, uh, in, in you, you know, you do them with Tino, the functional safety webinars, one yeah, of the big changes the from two is that they've changed from uh, should to now shall. So it's, it's gotten to where if people are saying, hey, you must have an SIS system uh, or we require functional safety within our systems, then it's now saying that the individuals that are responsible for designing these functional safety systems shall be competent. So it's also an important thing you know, for running. Everyone involved in the functional safety domain for his life cycle portion needs to be competent and it shall That's be. That's right. 
shall and, be. And please for comp uh, EX and COPC schemes, you know, it's an easy way to assess and to, to say I am competent is to go for a course provider, go for a training class and get your assessment so you eventually get the certification such as the one shown here for financial safety. Right. Not a requirement also in the 61508 or 511 standard does not say you have to go to a TUV training class for example. It just says you need to be proof competent and this is Again, easy way out, you know. Right, right. Well, but, you know, assess, it's not only, as we discussed today, it's not only sufficient to be competent, you have to be assessed competent, you have to be proven competent by somebody else. You know, it's been too easy for us to say, oh, I know it all, you know, I know it, I've done it. And right. Sometime, in, you know, that became, you became complacent with yourself and can be right. dangerous. Here, here's one thing that also to remember, too, is that with all of these competency programs, right, um, I mentioned that under the IECEX, the 001, that's a fundamentals course. There's no uh, prerequisites to take that course and, and actually get your certificate. There's actually no prerequisite to take any of the modules. However, in order to get your IECEX certificate for any of those modules beyond the 001, you also have to prove work experience, right? You can't just come in and say, hey, look, I'm gonna go ahead and take this exam. Because remember, it's not just the assessment of the knowledge, but what was your behavior? What was your experience? What, it, what have you done, right? The same thing holds true on your functional safety. You can't uh -huh. just you know, come out, right? You have to have some experience in industry and then go through it. Yes, minimum. You know, there's a minimum requirement, right? Yeah. So the same thing holds true for the various modules. So be aware of that. Um, it's it doesn't mean that you can't do it. It just means that be aware that if you want to go through it, uh, you should have at least a little bit of experience. And I think for the design course under the IECEX uh, COPC scheme, what we require in order to, if you pass the exams and do all this good stuff you should have a minimum of two years of work experience in the EX world before you get that, right? Okay, we're coming close to the end of the hour and it's getting late it's for you. Very <laughs> late, yes. Do you recommend an engineer to go if they wish to learn how to design a circuit to be intrinsically safe? Well, you know, this is a... <laughs> <laughs> come to work for GMI, then you can learn how to design a circuit. You can learn how to do that, right? But is there any standard or any course that yeah. uh, introduce you to that? Yeah, so the, the COMPEX and the IECEX uh, competency programs don't really get into the design of an IS circuit, right? And, and the requirements in an IS are going to be located in 60079-11. And that's basically telling you how to build uh, an associated apparatus. Now, designing of an IS system is part of the training program, meaning that I need to learn how to apply an associated apparatus in conjunction with a transmitter and my cable and my DCS or PLC. Absolutely, we would cover that. So it really depends. If you're, if you're thinking, I want to build intrinsic safety into my widget, that's different, right? As opposed to, I want to incorporate intrinsic safety into my overall system design by basically buying, asso buying associated apparatus devices and, and in designing my system around it. So that's the important thing to know. I believe next question is similar to this, but maybe wrong. Interested to know what competence is required to be an expert in EX design? Yeah. Um, different? Right. Yeah, well, the DSD is a big thing with regards to the Dash 25, and 14 spells out some specific details as to what is deemed uh, competency. And, and I'll, I'll tell you right off the top of my head, some of the things, you should have detailed knowledge of all of the protection concepts, right? So EXD, EXE, EXP, EXI, you know, all of the various protection concepts, you should have a good understanding of area classifications, both for gas and dust. Um, you should 
have a basic general understanding of all the installation requirements, types of cables, types of glands. So there's a lot of detailed information that is spelled out within 14 that says, hey, if, if you want to be an EX expert, if you will, you should have this knowledge and you should be assessed against that. Let me go to this question because we're coming close to the end of our time. I would like to have more insight on the best practice that we need to follow to make design complete for EX condition. A clear so, question, Bob? Yeah, I'm not sure. What's the slide say? <laughs> the next what slide. The slide says? It says, Oh, we, I, think, yeah. I couldn't remember this one. So, uh, here's, here's the other thing to remember. Again, we, we mentioned dash 14, we mentioned dash 17. 46 is an assembly standard, but here's the other thing to note. There are uh, additional requirements that you might find uh, out of the wiring regulations, right? So, in the UK, we might follow BS 7671. The Australia, uh, they're going to follow AS3000, the NEC here in the United States, the CEC in Canada. So you, you, you need to be aware of all the other relevant specific country specific standards, wiring regulations above and beyond, um, you know, that you might find in the IEC standards or the EN version of them. Yeah, basically, you know, you, you know, you need to follow all the relative standards beside, you know, the specific standards. That's right. Okay. Yeah, so we had, uh, I think we're coming close to the end of our presentation here today. And every time we get this question, uh, you know, that's, uh, the wrong time zone or, you know, can you do another webinar? Or, so we, let me remind you guys, uh, for all of those who have registered today, we get a copy of the presentation, we get a link how to view the presentation because all registration are, all webinars are recorded and they can be viewed in our YouTube channel, as you can see here, as well as you can go online and see our upcoming webinars. Now we're going into a vacation period, so we're gonna slow down on the webinars for a few weeks, but we'll come back at the end of August. Uh, we'll have some new ones. We're working on some new ones. Which we're working on new webinars, yes, new ideas. New topics. New topics, new ideas, and we'll uh, share those with you. So before we close today, let me see if I can share this poll. Let me ask you guys, how did Bob do today? Because he did everything for today. Let me launch this poll. And while you do answer, I will pause our, oops, missing the slide. Okay, I thought there was a slide with our content details, but you saw that earlier. All right, so you can scroll through the presentation eventually and see our, um, our content details, but we will send you any hour, an email, you get an email from our marketing team and be able to follow up with some questions. There were no live questions today. You guys must be asleep as we are. I'm trying to wake up, Bob is trying to go to bed. So <laughs> thank you, Bob. Thank you for uh, the, the response. hundred percent excellent. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And again, Bob, you know, you're a super duper guy. So thank you again. Thank you for being with us so late. That's uh, my pleasure. Thank you. And let's meet up again soon. Sounds great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, guys. See you next time. Bye-bye, Bob. Good night. Bye. Ciao, Bye, guys. guys. Ciao. Ciao.